You know, if I was going into battle when there were still pokies, I would wear a plate carrier like this. From this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. But he near so vile this day shall gentle his condition, and gentlemen to England now abed shall think themselves accursed if they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap while any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. Loose! Bad day to be a Frenchman. Gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. Today we are doing something, a bit of a passion project for me. Today we're going over the prowess of the English war bow. Now, you may be wondering, Agnes, aren't you a gun channel? And I would say, yes, yes I am. But what you don't also know, or you probably very well know, I'm a massive nerd and I love different periods of history. And one of those that gets my goat is the Hundred Years Wars and the implementation of the English war bow. Now, I can't explain why. Maybe in the video I will, but I love the English war bow. I love playing Total War, I run as the British, and I dominate the world with my English war bowmen. And today, we're gonna dominate your YouTube video with a little bit of English war bow action. I plan to go over a little bit of the history, a little bit of the prowess, a little bit of the reason why and the implementation, how it even ties into gun culture, and we're gonna test it against some armor, and we have a ballistic dummy to show off to you guys. It's gonna be a great freaking video. I don't know about you, I'm gonna have a great time. Let's dive on in. See that? That was an admin that wasn't liking and subscribe. But leave a comment in the comments section because those comments are a sacrifice to King Henry V himself to help us win the Battle of Agincourt. All right, back to the video. Now, the bow I'm using is a U-bow. It pulls around what I was told, 100 to 105 pounds. I haven't measured it yet, but that's on the low end of the spectrum when it comes to the power of these bows. So I wanted to employ the help of someone that has some true power with the bow, my friend Dash. Dash, get over here. Strength and honor. Strength and honor. We're two nerds getting after it on the flat range with some more bows. Dash, what's the pull on your bow? 165 pounds. All right, watch this. Okay, yeah, no. All right. Show them with my bow. Okay. Show them how easy right. it is. <laughs> you earned it. You know what? You earned it. Thanks. So that's a demonstration of how much power it takes to run these bendy sticks. Now let's do some shooting. So knock, draw, loose. Now, the English war bow has a lot of maybe boomer lore around it, what we would call in gun culture, where that these things were like sending Sabo death rounds down range. This was disproven by Todd's workshop. They did an excellent job with that video. A lot of great attention to detail. Yeah. And of course, we're gonna try it for ourselves because, well, I have a YouTube channel. I wanna do some fun stuff. But I bought some armor from eBay and I have that ballistic dummy. And I say we set it up real quick and see how some arrows do in comparison to that armor. So I think it'd be a fun little example because in certain pop culture and lore, it's like these arrows are death machines, right. instant one hit kill, which I don't think is the case. It's just, a, you know, it's like getting hit by a dart, a big dart. I mean, if it hits you in the brain or the heart, you're probably gonna die yeah. right away. For the most part, you could do Maybe. a... Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, depending on where you get hit, you can yeah. still do some fighting. I mean, the Baron of Ebelin, he had a arrow through his testicle and fought for, was it three days? I once fought two days with an arrow through my testicle. I would just cry. I, I, I would go home. I would I mean, go can home. I go home? I go back to France. Yeah, I'm out. Does someone say France? Oh, I ate burgundy, ate French, ate the crossbow. Love me knights, love me longbow, love me King Henry. Simple as. We're gonna take his dead body and we're gonna throw him over the city walls. We are in. Get in there. Oh, she's beautiful. Yes, my lord. It will be an epic battle. So now what we're gonna do is test against the armor. Now I'm pretty sure, I have a feeling it's gonna stop. I have a feeling Dash's arrows are gonna probably do some more damage. This is just some cheap armor off eBay. Feels sturdy. I mean, yeah, I think it'll be, oh. So mm, I have maybe. a, on the lighter end of my bow's weight, about a 500 grain arrow. Now I thought, in gun guy terms, I was thinking maybe 20 inch M16, 55 grain projectile, 3000 feet per second, this would be the archery equivalent of that. And then I have some more of Dash's arrows where it has a little bit more mass behind it and a bigger bodkin head. And then Dash's arrows are the big boy arrows. Yes. Those are like- 1500 I mean, grains. 1500 grains. That's a pretty heavy projectile moving very quick. So let's see what happens. Up first, we have the smaller arrow. Oh. 
Oh! Clearly this poor knight didn't get the best Milanese steel available. Oh, it penetrated and got the flesh. Nice. There, Cole, right. get in here. I would like to say maybe my theory has some legs. The light arrow with a very thin projectile managed to punch through the armor. Now, of course, this isn't like medieval accurate. Just bought off eBay. Feels like it would stop a blade and any sort of thing coming yeah, at you. So, yeah. But King Baratheon would cave in your chest with one swing of his hammer. God, that was strong then. And it actually got into the flesh. Now, it's not a lethal flesh wound. I think maybe if the armor was hugging closer, it could have had a better chance. It's probably in there maybe like a little bit, a fraction of an yeah, inch. Yeah, I'd say half an inch maybe. Half an inch? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a bad day, it's gonna hurt. It's not gonna be comfy. So then the other arrow, this other bodkin point, not as narrow as the first, seemed like it got a good penetration, but I think it maybe got a little poke on it, but not too much, it didn't catch the skin, unlike our thinner arrow. Now the, uh, the actual grown-up bow is gonna <laughs> see what he can do. <laughs> Whoa! Ugh. Nice! Yo, that's cool. Oh, you got <laughs> deep into him. Yeah, that's You in got the lungs. really deep into yeah. him. Okay, so this arrow, it kind of caught the armor, definitely penetrated. Now, this arrow up top, there was plenty of uh, flesh for it to catch underneath, and that entire botkin head is now stuck in there. This entire point of this <laughs> pyramid, it's uh, inside your flesh, which, um, if you have to fight now, it's not a good vibe. Keep in mind, underneath our dummy plate armor, there's nothing protecting him. Right. So what we're gonna do is also throw the riveted chain mail yep. underneath and we're gonna see if that helps out anymore. So in Todd's workshop, they had some of the best plate armor made, yes. right? I mean, you're thinking like nobility level plate. We were talking about what if there's just some Smo Joe that had to put together a night suit and didn't get the best armor yep. available. And in this case, that could be that where maybe those impacts are now penetrating through. Keep in mind, we're about 10 yards away, but that's still viable. I mean, you're a battle. There's no rules to how close or how far you're gonna shoot. Yep. Now, the reason we're so close is that these dummies are expensive. So we would like to give a big thank you to these video sponsors such as Gentlemen, Admin from the future working on the MP40 video. Spoiler alert? Yes. I, of course, want to give a big thank you to the sponsors of this video, such as American Hartford Gold. Gentlemen, I love my brass and lead. I really do. But sometimes you have to diversify that precious metal investment portfolio, such as gold and silver. Now, I'm not a financial guru, but you may be someone that leans toward the gold and silver market. So if that is your case, then I would encourage you to go check out American Hartford Gold. There's no question that the American dollar can be contested on the world stage today questioning how potent it can be in the free market. So having a backup plan is important in this day and age. And American Hartford Gold can help you get there. If you close a deal with them, I believe they will give you $5,000 of free silver, which I'm gonna be honest, sounds too good to be true. So I might wanna, wanna hop on that deal. We also have to thank Americana Pipe Dream Apparel. They didn't get me the sweet camo, but they have a bunch of sweet camo on the website. And oftentimes it will go out of stock super quick. So if you miss the drop, then you're out of luck. So I would monitor their website. I would get on their email list and I would be in tune with what they are up to because they don't just do camouflage and surplus they have night vision they have manuals knives a bunch of cool stuff on the website so a big thank you to those young zoomers I love them very much and they're funny I don't know why they sponsor me because they could just do their own content because they're so funny all right back to the war bell they took the little ones be still be still Frodo where's Frodo I let him go then you did what I could not I tried to take the ring from him the ring is beyond our reach now. I failed you all. No, you fought bravely. <laughs> all right, so what we got here is some riveted flat 10 millimeter chain mail. There's two types. There's butted mail and riveted mail. Riveted mail is substantially better in quality and resistance. So this was made for me and I've tested it a bit, but it does good, good work. So this is solid stuff and should provide some good protection, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Yes. Uh, is that what the elves gave you? Is that called Mithril? Yes, yes, that and uh, Sting. Yeah, unpaid intern. Uh, Mithril comes from the dwarves, not the elves. Well, the elves gave Fro- Shut up! So before we tape on the Mithril, we're gonna check our hits. You can see, whoa, look at this hit. So I think we hit a lung, which is pretty freaking nuts. Imagine getting your lung poked through armor. That's not, that was a great hit. Uh, where's my 55 grade? Oh, where's my 55 grade? Yours Damn. was right here. Oh, my bad. That was right there. So okay. you can see that didn't go into any yeah. It just stayed on the, the flesh. Which would be, you'd have to like break it to keep fighting if yeah. you were to stay in the fight. If your adrenaline's gone. Right. That is freaking cool. All right, Jordan. 
Sorry, it's, it's not the unpaid intern today. It's Squire. Squire Jordan. All right, that should be good. Yeah, I think so. <sighs> Their armor is weak at the neck and underneath the arm. All right, you gotta get hit. Oh, sorry guys. <laughs> the audience may get an execution as a snack. Nice! I think we got him. Yeah. Whoa, come check out this chin shot. Now, Dash is jumping the gun a little bit, going sorry, through the head. Sorry. Okay, now, am I mad about it? Absolutely not, because it's freaking cool. But check this out, that is gnarly. Imagine catching a spear to the face. Holy crap, man. That's awesome work, dude. Before we get to uh, the real cream of the crop, the side shot went through the armor and it caught just a little bit of the skin outside of the rib cage, which is pretty cool. Now, I'll try and get this guy out of here. Okay. Well, uh, you know, we'll leave him. Yeah, He's not yeah, yeah. So, we caught the male, okay? Yes. Now, I can see from my perspective on Dash's arrow that it penetrated. Now, my arrow didn't do as well uh, with the 100 pounds, you know, 500 grain arrow. It penetrated the chain mail, but it only really poked his skin, which would be a, a big inconvenience. You could probably pull that out. Dash's is pretty embedded in that skin. You know, Street, we can't pop her off. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it went in half an inch probably. Half an inch. Yeah, right there. So it's Dang. loaded down enough. So when I bought this armor, I thought it was 16 gauge. So I'm curious what the composition is. Yeah. Cause in um, Todd's workshop video, that was some great looking armor. Yeah. And it was stopping Joe Gibbs bow. Like yeah. It was nothing. Yeah. It was... And he was shooting a very accurate, you know, reproduction Mary Rose yeah. style arrows with a very heavy bow mm -hmm. like you're shooting. So. And then the other thing is it's like hardened steel versus mild steel, mm -hmm. right? This is probably mild steel. Yeah. I'd imagine because it's pretty flexible. Hardened steel basically adds that extra layer that causes it just to deflect off and bounce off a little nice. bit. So okay. catches a little more on this. And I mean, we're using oversized bows and super heavy duty bodkin tips. So yeah. that's gonna punch just about anything. So we've set the premise already that Dash and I, especially Dash with his more powerful bow, we have showed that the armor I got has not going to stop these arrows. And even my smaller arrows with a lighter bow. So I figure let's just show the what it looks like to get shot just with no armor, bare chested by these arrows. I think it'd be kind of carnage worthy. I, I agree. <laughs> let's do it. Look at this orc arrow. Look at this. <laughs> oh, right in the sternum. <laughs> oh, nerd. Oh yeah. That's gnarly. That's crazy. Soft, the gushy parts right there. Yeah. Orc arrow didn't penetrate too hot. No, I mean it hit went right on the sternum, yeah, so I think that that's slowed it down. I would be, yeah, he'd be not happy. Yeah. And then we have this arrow. Got looks like it got some good depth in her. Yeah. Getting in those lungs and the organs. Oof. Oh my gosh, that's yeah, that's how deep, deep she was. Yeah, yeah that's, 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 I'd call that fatal. Uh -huh. And then we have a right shoulder shot, pretty clean right shoulder shot. I think he would survive that one. Yeah, I mean, no vital, yeah, I think yeah. he'd be all right. It would suck, push it through, but you'd yeah. be all right, you know? Push it through, don't break the arrow. Yes. All right, more powerful bow. The all adult right. bow's up. Look at that stance, that <laughs> wind up. <laughs> Without trying, he's just so majestic. He's like Aragorn we have at home. <laughs> It doesn't get old. It does not get no, old. No, it does not. Oh, nice. Yeah, give me a botkin in the center. Show me your worth your pay, Archer. That's a pretty good impression. That's not bad. Oh, <laughs> the crunch. <laughs> I the know. crunch, dude. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and it went through yeah. the other side, dude. Freaking nice, man. Uh, that's satisfying. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that gave me like the shiver down the hood. Oh. The noise was yeah. just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting soft, Dash. <laughs> we have Frenchmen to kill. Dude, that was a nice deep one. Now, imagine you just like, you're, you're beat bopping, no armor on, you're trying to fight some English long bowmen, and your buddy next to you just got a freaking arrow through his bones, through his heart, through, I mean, that's not his heart up there. I need to retake my anatomy class. Okay. 
but that is gnarly. Yeah. Now, the nice thing about these bodkins is you can pull them out relatively easy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Warfare. It's a heck. What would be an admin video without a proper headshot? <laughs> oh my God. Let's do it again. The crunch doesn't get old. Oh, okay, I'm, <laughs> I got rest of it. So the, the thing, these bows are so heavy. <laughs> when you keep going rep after rep, it is literally like a workout. Ooh. So we're gonna take a quick break. Yeah. Now while Dash takes a quick break, I'm gonna try his 165 pound bow as, as far as I can get on a pretty close target. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> POV, you caught the French lacking. Oh, oh, good Lord. Right through the jaw. Do you think he'd still be alive? For a little bit. For a little bit. Yeah, you would be alive enough to know it sucks. Guys, God, <laughs> I can't do this out, buddy. All right, that's pretty cool. Now I want to try. Oh, Ooh. this is the one. Mine didn't penetrate the other side. Yeah. I, I think I caught more of the skull. Yeah, I think, oh. Oh, oh, we got blood now. Yeah, you definitely hit more of the skull. What is that? You say you like the French. Dang, dude, that is freaking crazy. What, you shoot arrow at head, it goes in? Man, these bows are really cool. They're really powerful, but they are nothing without the archer. All they are is a bendy stick. It takes a true archer, like Dash, to master these bows. Oh, oh yeah. nice. This is a good little hit. Yeah. All right, now let's try a quick execution shot. Oh, dude, that felt dirty. You have committed a war crime. Definitely cracked the back of his yeah. skull. I don't think he'd be okay. So the English war bow is a powerful weapon, but it's just a bendy stick shooting a smaller stick. It's nothing without the archer itself. That's what makes this weapon so interesting to me is that the English long bowmen had had a culture that encouraged shooting. It was mandated by law. You had to go out and shoot your bow under a penalty, all right, of violating the law, which in medieval times would not, would not be good for you, all right? You don't, have, you don't get a great lawyer. <laughs> but it is really cool. It gave them this really unique X factor. Now that X factor is that these these archers were so dialed in, so in tune with their gear, that they could take on a threat that was much more uh, well-equipped, well-funded than themselves, which is called a force multiplier. That's why it makes it so interesting. These archers were both feared throughout that part of Britain and France, and they were often recruited as mercenaries, and they were an excellent tool for, a, say, a knight, a baron, a lord, a king, to go on a conquest to make some more money at a very affordable rate. Knights cost a lot of money, archers are much cheaper. So there was no ye old gym. And what did these archers do? Well, they started at a young age, probably about 15. And as he stated, they were required by law. But the crazy thing is in order to handle the immense pressure of the draw weight, 160, 170, sometimes 180, it would actually change and adapt their entire skeletal structure so that you can actually identify a bowman by his skeleton because of the deformations and adaptations that are required in order to handle the immensity of that draw. Now on the physicality of the archers, this was something that was fascinating to me as a modern man because I have access to a gym and I like to think I work out a lot. I can push around heavier weight. That's more than the average person. I'm not saying I'm a super strong guy, but I do take pride in lifting weights. So I was curious getting into the heavy war bows, how quickly I could adapt. And when I just got my lonely little uh, 100 to 105 pound bow, I gotta give myself the extra five pounds to feel good. It was really hard to work and string up and I did actually feel like I broke in the bow, but I also developed a little bit more strength when it came to shooting this bow. Now someone like Dash, who can pull back a 165 to 175 pound bow, and he's been doing it for much longer, he has a much more refined set of muscles back there that is working for him. I will say that the effects of shooting it, I can feel it in the gym now, doing certain exercises when it's focused on my right arm and uh, my core and my back, I can feel this extra weird little muscle that I didn't really know I had before. So that was a really cool little bonus. 
Nice. While the English Warbo certainly has a great allure to it, it's got a very aesthetic look. At the end of the day, it's just a single piece of wood, either self bow or a laminate bow. So compared to other composite type bows that are present in Mongolian culture or in Turkey or Ottoman Empire, they are not as efficient. In fact, they really get out distance and outsped by those and you need a heavier arrow in order to make it work properly. So they have their place in history because of the immense strength that was required in the dedication. But in reality, on tech, is just a bendy stick. Bendy stick. <laughs> now, while this bow isn't as complex as, say, the Eastern style composite bows, what it has going for it is the weakness, but also its strength, is that it is simple. It's just a simple stave. So if you are a nation state leader trying to equip an army, equipping guys with a simple stave is rather easy. Now, I believe during this time, during that era of English you know, supremacy of the war bow, there were certain taxes even placed on merchants that they had to pay in you staves. And there was you coming from Spain, Spain, from Switzerland, from all over Europe to feed the armies of the English Warbow. Now, I think one reason why I love the English Warbow so much is that this era where it's in, it's on a weird twilight zone of the old ways dying and the new ways being ushered in, essentially changing humanity forever. For most of the known existence of humankind, unless we have lost ancient civilizations that use laser guns. Mankind use instruments to poke each other to death, and the English Warbow is taking that concept and just giving you a little bit more space. Now, archery, of course, is nothing new to the concept of fighting, but it is just so popularized through this era. We have gunpowder show up in Europe around 12, 1300s, which changes warfare, of course, forever. One would think that with the advent of gunpowder, this style of fighting would just vanish overnight, but it doesn't. It sticks around, and gunpowder is used mainly in the form of cannons and until it becomes more used as handgunners. What really puts the kibosh on the archer in this period is the better development of firearms. If we think about, of course, the early handguns aren't that effective, but as the matchlock guns get better, as the uh, arquebuses get better, I probably butchered that word, and then we get to the musket. The musket's gonna reign supreme for a good chunk until it gets rifling in the percussion cap. But the musket will dominate, of course, and one may think, well, even in the Revolutionary War, if we watch movies like The Patriot, those Brits are lining up, they have zero armor, and those guys are all English, and they're using the brown best, but what about the longbow? Well, yes, I get that, but the problem is, is the time it takes to create the archer. That is, of course, that secret sauce, that X factor. There is an old phrase that says, if you want to create a good archer, you start with his grandfather. And that really brings home the point of how much time is dedicated to create these warriors. And that is one of the things that really slowed them down when they started to get wiped out. Because if you have generations of people that are in fact going through this training, there's no way that you can equip them and keep them out in warfare if they keep dying off. So when you get things that really help to speed things up, the firearm, the crossbow, that only takes a day or two of training, it's gonna be easier to produce far larger numbers of people on the field that are able to do almost the same amount of damage with minimal training. Now I did talk about how we phased out the war bow in fighting, but as the war bow phased out in this era and it was dead and dormant for a while, something did come back. A soldier by the name of Mad Jack Churchill who picked up the longbow and used it for the last time. But I, of course, can only explain it so well. So my friend, the fat electrician, is going to help us explain it real quick. How's that childhood nursery rhyme go? Jack be nimble, Jack be quick. Jack killed a Nazi with a giant toothpick. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, John Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Churchill, a.k.a. Mad Jack. During his lifetime, he was a newspaper editor, an actor, a professional male model, a surfer, a competitive bagpipe player, an archery champion, one of the first ever British commandos in World War II, and the last man credited with killing an enemy combatant with a bow and arrow. Mad Jack first saw a battle in France in 1940, marching into battle, playing the bagpipes with nothing more than his long bow and a broadsword. It is during the defense of France that he is credited with killing at least one German soldier with his bow. Thanks, Nick. Go check out the fat electrician when you get a chance. Now, as you saw in that talking segment, Dash and I just kept shooting and talking, one of us taking a break and talking, the other shooting, and even in that span, we, were, we both talked about how we got tired and my back was starting to cramp up real quick, and it shows that... Yeah, you know, you have an archer, he's well-equipped, he's well-shot, but there's still the human element of 
you're gonna get tired shooting this thing. And imagine we're well fed, we're well rested, we had caffeine, we had a little bit of zen, got a little snack in, we feel great. And this is a great day to be out here, the weather's awesome, but imagine at adverse conditions. You've been marching in hostile country, bad sleep, maybe dysentery. you got dysentery, yeah. you're shitting your brains out, you know, and now maybe it's cold out, it's rainy, it's wet, and you have to finally string your bow up to fight, and you have to physically perform. That's an interesting human factoid about this that maybe gets lost in history or movies or TV, even video games. And it's really fun to experience this for yourself. And the idea of 10 to 12 arrows a minute for a warbow archer always sounded slow when people look at it. And you have Lars Anderson mm -hmm. doing those quick bop, bop, bop shots. What is this? A bow. For ants. But it's much more of a feat of strength than actual speed. Yeah. Because to do that continuously, 10 to 12, think of it like a max bench. Yep. Think of it like a bent over row. Doing your max number 10 to 12 times continuously over the course of a battle is exhausting. And so really that number sounds slow, but it's more about their strength and endurance than about their ability to rapidly fire. Because guess what? After you run out of arrows and the enemy's still closing in on you, you have to draw blades and fight people. Now, you know what, we've been shooting pretty close. I say Dash and I send off an arrow into the distance to see what sort of arc and range we can get. Okay, knock, draw, loose. Nice, all right. I, I, I was tracking mine, mine did not go as far as I thought, but uh, I think yours went to uh, the stratosphere. <laughs> <laughs> So for perspective, that was the 130 pound bow, which is the lightest one for me. And I really wasn't going full tilt. We didn't want to launch it way into the distance. You can see here where the trucks are at and we're still probably pretty close to 180 yards. And that just demonstrates the fact that these arrows are not flight arrows. They are heavy duty war arrows and they're still making good distance downrange. POV, you use cheat codes in Medieval 2 Total Warfare and advance your civilization 300 years. Got him. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah, I think that's a piece of the bone right there. Oh, I didn't go through and through. No. That's surprising. This guy's tough. Now, of course, this isn't the gun that immediately followed longbows, but a good, like, Virginia flintlock long rifle. And it did an excellent damage to our cheap metal and our dummy, he took a solid round to the chest. Go ahead and pop that guy open. We got a nice little entrance wound right underneath the sternum. And uh, I would say, I would say he's dead. I'd say we got him for sure. And it kind of shows like that was only one shot and those muskets or black powder guns are slow to load. They're a lot more efficient and easy to use than a war bell. That was not tiring whatsoever to load and shoot. So it really puts into perspective in a historical sense. And logistically, if I die, eh, well, Dash can pick this up and he can use it now. Fire! All right, he's no longer a bowman. He's now a musketeer. <laughs> Way easier. Yeah. Check it Whoa. out. Yo, Colton, get your ass over here. That Look what we got right here. Not the mithril. We have mm -hmm. a little, we have our lead ball. It's not good for you. And then we have an indent on the back. Dash just chose a better spot to shoot our dummy. Yeah, I don't think I hit any ribs. I think I hit the soft spot. Yeah, turns out I'm the dummy. Okay, nice gut shot. And then we had a pass through and we have an indent on the back of the armor. Oh, he's falling over, I caught him. It's cool to see the bolt holes, the entrance and the exits of the musket round, or I should say the rifle round, versus the arrows. It's all like squares, squares and circles. Yeah, I know. That's kind of cool. Best job I ever had. Best job I ever had. Best job I ever had. Now say you were at Cressy, Poitiers, Agincourt. You just fired all your arrows and now the real fight begins. St. George! <laughs> ah! That was really cathartic. I had a lot of built up stuff. <laughs> Throwback time, pop quiz. What did Kane use to kill Abel? A big old rock. That's the worst thing today. It was just a rock. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Mate, 
That's diabolical. So he's, he's got a couple of uh, skin lacerations, a couple bullet wounds, some, some arrow wounds. Um, he's, got a, he's got a wound to his vertebrae and his neck here. Not sure what happened there, but, but what really did him in and killed him was the cost of his health care. Well, at least my schools ain't got bloody shit. Well, gentlemen, this was an excellent video, in my opinion, on the English war boat. I had a blast. It's something of a passion pit for me, and I want to give a big thank you to my friend Dash for coming all the way out here. He drove 12 hours. <laughs> Better go check him out. Dash, where can people find you, man? Uh, I'm on YouTube. It's Dash Rendar. On Instagram, Garnish and Gains, it's a lot of just nerdy ancient warfare content, bows, slings, swords, all the fun stuff, and a little bit of Star Wars and gaming, you know, trickled in there as well. We hit it off pretty well. We're both massive nerds. Well, gentlemen, if you enjoyed this video, guys, feel free to like and subscribe. Leave a comment in the comment section down below. Your comments are a sacrifice to Gang Enray the Fifth, the winner of Agin Corp. Sorry, I know, I had to do it. As always, gentlemen, great way to support the channel is Patreon merch. Patreon has exclusive content, early access to videos, and a bunch of other fun stuff, stuff like a Discord. We got nothing else for you. We'll catch you on the flip. Woo -woo. How now, brown cow? How now, brown cow? So, the two nerds are now massively... <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, uh, King Baratheon, Robert Baratheon would cave in and... <laughs> Good job, man. Thanks, dude. No, hold on. Right, right. Knuckles. There All we go. Right. Of course he looks majestic. Oh, you're still going? No, I'm done. I'm oh, done. Shit. It's not like, oh. It's not chambered. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Now before, now before, uh, well, um, Mike ready? That's not a great feeling. Oh crap. Sure. All the might of the war bow and he's scared of the musket. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll give it a whirl, sure. <laughs> I'm not using a bow, I'd just be using big rock. Dude. Oh. Oh. We also, of course, have to thank Americana Pipe Dream Apparel. Now, they didn't get me this swick. We also have to thank American Pipe. Falling apart.